with the others. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third class of the course, Deep Learning by Example and Bible. This uh, course teaches the basics of deep learning and of different types of deep learning networks through a set of hands-on biological examples implemented in CARES. Each class is supposed to be standalone. So for those of you who did not take previous classes, I will provide background information which is necessary and hopefully will be sufficient for you to understand the contents of this class. Uh, the class will comprise two parts. Uh, the first one lecture, uh, a bigger part, which together with your questions and possible discussions uh, is expected to take about an hour and a half. And then there will be pr practical part, depending on how much uh, time we have left, um, uh, but uh, in practical part, I will address your possible questions about uh, the software, the examples, but the examples are actually self-explanatory. So I assume for most of you, it should not be a problem to run uh, the examples without uh, the, my comments, my uh, explanations. And uh, besides there is a, a user manual page which I will uh, um, provide the link for uh, during the lecture. Uh, this class is being recorded. So for those of you who would not like your face to, to, to be in the recording, please make sure to turn off your video. And uh, also please uh, uh, keep yourself muted during uh, most of the uh, class. After each slide, I will make a stop and ask, ask if you have questions. So if you have a questions, uh, then please unmute yourself and ask a short question about the current slide or any previous slide. And let's postpone longer discussions uh, till the end of the presentation when we should have plenty of time uh, for, for further discussion. And after the class, I will make uh, a link to the video available when it is available on our, on our website and we'll send an email to everyone. Uh, finally, uh, during the class, we will make two breaks after each 45 minutes, a five minute break. So a total there will be two breaks during the class. Uh, any questions so far? No. So I proceed to the first slide. Uh, and let me start from um, the intuitive description of what is autoencoder. Uh, consider a network like the one shown in this slide, which comprises a number of uh, data tensors or um, matrices, data matrices, uh, shown as rectangles, separated by the layers or transformations between the data matrices, uh, which are shown as crosses. In order for this network to be an autoencoder, it must satisfy at least two basic requirements. The first requirement is that the size of the input tensor and the output tensor, meaning the number of elements of the tensor shown as boxes should be exactly the same. And the second requirement is that uh, at least one of the intermediate data tensors in between input and output should have the dimension uh, smaller than the input and output tensor. And the intermediate data tensor with the smallest, the least number of elements is called, uh, called a code or also called a latent space. The part of the a network before the code is uh, termed encoder, and the part of the network after the code is called decoder. So how all of this works? After we load data to the input data tensor, the data start to propagate towards the output tensor. And in particular, the data pass through the code tensor. We say that data gets encoded here in the code tensor in a smaller number of elements 
of, and uh, subsequently, of course, the data will be decoded or reconstructed back to the original number of elements at the output of the network. We train the network, the network parameters, so as to minimize the reconstruction error. In other words, we will try to make the values at the output uh, of the network as close as possible to the values at, at the input of the network. And after this training is done, and if it was successful, then the values of uh, at the elements of uh, the code tensor will actually store all the information necessary for reconstruction of the data. So we say that the code tensor would be a lower dimensional encoding uh, of the original data. Um, so the basic uh, capability of the autoencoder, of any autoencoder, is reduction of dimensionality. In other words, compression of data into smaller size. However, in addition to this basic capability, specifically designed autoencoders can perform a number of other tasks. And uh, we will discuss two examples. The first example is denoising autoencoder. This type of autoencoder can denoise, for example, a noisy image, the noise uh, uh, shown here as white dots. So after processing, after uh, um, uh, processing this autoencoder, we get noise-free image at the output. The biological example of denoising autoencoder is called adage. This abbreviation stands for analysis using denoising autoencoders of gene expression. This kind of autoencoder can be used for removing noise from gene expression data. For example, from microarray data, which are known to be noisy. The other example is variational autoencoder. This type of uh, network is uh, called also generative model, meaning that it can generate new data from already existing data. For example, being trained on a data set of face images, variational autoencoder can produce a new face, which was not there in the training data set. Or it can take one of these existing images of these faces and modify it to make it smile. The biological example of variational autoencoder is called T-Belt. It will be discussed today as a biological example in the second uh, part of the lecture. And the purpose of this application is to reduce dimensionality of cancer transcriptome to extract biologically meaningful latent space from the cancer transcriptome. Yet another topic, very important one that we will discuss in this class is hyperparameter optimization, like finding the optimal number of layers in the network or finding the optimal sizes of tensors in the network or the types, the best types of activations or the base types of layers like uh, convolutional, recurrent, whatever, and other hyperparameters. These topics are very important and relevant not only to the uh, uh, to the hyper, uh, uh, to the variational auto or to, to autoencoders in general. Uh, it, they, it's relevant to any type of deep learning network, but uh, we will discuss it in this class because that. Uh, 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 technique was heavily used for the uh, T-Belt application that we will discuss. And uh, hyperparameter optimization or tuning is performed with specialized packages. We will discuss uh, during the class one of the packages called Keras Tuner, but I will also briefly uh, uh, mention another package, which Candle, uh, which is also available on BioWolf as a separate module. And so you may optionally use uh, this package as well. Any questions so far? Gennady, I see Henry Lesson might have a question. Mm -hmm. Henry, go ahead and ask your question, please. All right, thank you. 
uh, I my question is, so I remember in class one when we did semantic uh, segmentation that the UNET structure or the UNET uh, algorithm that you taught us had kind of the same idea where you reduce the dimensionality of the data and then brought it back up. So is just to make sure I, un I understand this is kind of so that algorithm had a component auto encoding component to it or is that just entirely separate oh it's different yes it is kind of it's kind of hybrid what we saw in the unit it's a kind of it's not exactly auto encoder but you remember there were shortcuts the yes. agent shortcuts it was the difference uh, 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 that's what differs uh, unit from regular auto encoder otherwise okay. they are pretty much similar the point of that was that uh, you don't know how many features, you, you don't know in advance how many uh, uh, features you, if essential biological features you, ha you have to have in the biological example of the first class. So if you say, for example, we specified code tensor too small, then uh, we may lose some of the features. It may not get through. So we added uh, uh, the uh, shortcuts to communicate the features that we're not able to get through this uh, small code tensor. Is that I clear see. enough? Okay. Yes, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, no more questions. I proceed to the next uh, slide. If you have questions later, you can ask later after, after the next slide. Um, so this, uh, as I usually do, uh, we I, uh, give overview of the old examples. Today we will focus on example number three, and I would like to discuss um, the difference of this example from the previous two examples. And there are four, I would say, probably uh, major differences. One, first of all, is we are dealing now with unsupervised machine learning approach, which means there will not be labels, will not be ground truth uh, 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 labels for this example. But uh, instead of labels that we show normally at the output of network, like we did in supervised machine learning, we, uh, at the output, we, have, we want to have exactly the same data as the input, so no labels. Uh, the second difference is that uh, there is no autoencoder specific type of layer. Uh, in the previous two examples, the convolutional uh, uh, network had a convolutional layer as a major building block. The same uh, for recurrent uh, network. It had some recurrent layer type of. For autoencoder, there is no uh, autoencoder type of layer, which would be a building block for autoencoder. Any uh, type of, uh, of layers like convolutional, recurrent, dense, or fully connected can be used uh, as a part of autoencoder. The third difference is that we are dealing actually here with a composite network. That's the first example when the network can be naturally subdivided into two subnetworks, encoder and decoder. And that subdivision does make sense. And uh, we gain from it, we benefit from it. And the last uh, uh, difference is that in this example, uh, in this class, we will discuss hyperparameter optimization, hyperparameter tuning that we never discussed previously. Any questions about this slide? No, uh, next slide. Um, so uh, to get a better feeling of uh, 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 how autoencoder works, let's start from very, very simple uh, model. And uh, I start to describe the data for that model. The data would be a gene expression matrix uh, with uh, 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 rows as samples. Uh, we have a number of samples, and uh, there are three columns uh, corresponding to uh, genes, and the values of the matrix are gene expression levels. The gene expression levels may be only of two, two kinds. Uh, it, the gene expression may be one, which means gene is expressed, or it may be zero, gene is unexpressed. Uh, the value one is colored uh, field cell whereas zero is unfilled white cell. And uh, uh, the task of this uh, um, example is to train a basic autoencoder model uh, on this data. And we will discuss two examples 
of autoencoder models. Uh, the first model is simpler, and you see it uh, comprises total three data tensors, the input tensor, the output tensor, and the intermediate data tensor, which is actually code tensor. And the other model is more sophisticated. It has three intermediate data tensors. In the previous classes, we discussed that the uh, layers or transformation uh, between data tensors. A layer is called a um, uh, hidden layer if it outputs uh, the uh, intermediate data tensor. For example, this one, this layer would be hidden because it, uh, the data follows from the left to the right and uh, this layer outputs the hidden representation. So, and this one is not hidden because it outputs the, um, uh, the output tensor. So this layer has this uh, model has only one hidden layer. The second model has three hidden layers, if you can count easily. So we also mentioned in the previous classes that whenever a model, a network model, has at least two hidden layers with adjustable parameters, that model is called deep model. So in our definition, the second model will be deep model because it has three more than enough uh, hidden layers. Whereas the first one is not deep, it's shallow model. Now, uh, uh, we also have a, a number of uh, uh, hyperparameters in this model. Uh, and let's discuss what type of hyperparameters because we will be optimizing the hyperparameters in a short while. Let's talk about hyperparameters. The first uh, hyperparameters important one are the types of layers. Uh, it may be dense, it may be uh, uh, convolutional, it may be recurrent, maybe some other types. Uh, but uh, for this model, both models, we do not vary this uh, feature, uh, this hyperparameter, all the layers will be dense. The second important hyperparameter is depth. Of, uh, uh, of encoder and of decoder. By depth here, I define depth as the number of green tensors uh, in encoder and decoder. And you see the encoder and decoder are symmetric. So if depth is one, uh, then uh, we have a deep model. If depth is zero, then we have shallow model. So again, once again, depth is number of green tensors shown as green, different from the uh, code tensor. The next important is latent dimension or code size. Uh, uh, in this case, it is two because we have only two. Oh, I forgot to mention that's important. Uh, two of the genes, uh, X and Y, are expressed independently one from another. But the third one is uh, uh, dependent on the two previous. Basically, uh, the value of expression level of the third gene will be a product of X and Y. And that has a clear biological sense. The gene XY is expressed if and only if uh, um, both X and Y are expressed. So um, because we have only two independent variables in this example, then the code uh, tensor is expected to have dimension two. That's why we set as two. And uh, next is uh, input dimension, which is the dimension of the green tensor. Uh, it is uh, here uh, fixed at value three, uh, the same at the input and output, and the activations. We will talk uh, more detail in more details about activations in, in the next slide, but for the uh, uh, shallow model, we assume linear activations. And for uh, the uh, uh, for the deep model, the, some of the activations will be uh, tangent, that would be nonlinear, would be uh, hyperbolic tangent on sigmoid. Any questions so far? No, I proceed to the next slide, which uh, presents the uh, code for both the models. It's arguably would be uh, uh, one of the simplest uh, code, if not the simplest one for describing an autoencoder, because we have very highly simplified model. This code dimension, just two, 
uh, I can hardly think about uh, smaller code dimensions than two. And the input, all the other tensors are just well, bigger by one element. Uh, and uh, this uh, model described actually, this could describe both the models. The only difference is in the value of the hyperparameter depth. And this code, it is set to one, but uh, so that code will correspond to the deep model. But if we uh, set that uh, to zero, that would be shallow model example. And the entire code comprises uh, four steps as we discussed previously, uh, like for any uh, program written in Keras, it's header, getting data, defining the model and running the model. The header part of the code it will be represented by a set of Python imports. Then at the step of getting data, we uh, uh, generate uh, the synthetic uh, data matrix on the fly, gene expression matrix, uh, uh, with uh, uh, X and Y sampled randomly from some distribution. And uh, the uh, third gene for the third gene, X, Y, just product of the expression levels of X and Y. And uh, define, the step of defining the model, we uh, use the sequential construct approach uh, for both uh, encoder and decoder uh, subnetworks, which means initially those models uh, will be uh, just uh, uh, represented by empty container. And then we sequentially add layers to those containers uh, at dense layers. And the final uh, uh, model, the combined model, will be a combination of the two. Uh, definition of the uh, model will be completed after we compile it. Compiling of the model means basically checking that anything, whatever, all the items that we will need for running the model are in place and are defined correctly. In order for the model to compile, Keras requires us that we specify uh, at least two items of information. One is the loss function. It's a function of parameters that will be minimized during the training procedure. In this case, we selected mean squared error. This is already a predefined function. So it suffices just to specify the name of the loss function. And the second item is uh, optimizer. It's a particular algorithm that will be used uh, for minimization of the loss. In this case, we selected algorithm called Adam. And finally, running the model will just uh, uh, um, will be done by calling the method fit of the model. And that method takes the first two arguments are supposed to be the data and the labels. But because in this example, we don't have labels, it's uh, unsupervised machine learning uh, example. Then instead of the second argument, instead of labels, we substitute the same data as uh, the first argument. And we will, uh, evaluate the accuracy of uh, training of our progress using the so-called validation loss. Uh, validation loss means that we uh, first, uh, we generate a, a validation data set by randomly splitting the uh, uh, training data set. Uh, the portion of 20% of, of the training data set will be randomly split and randomly sampled. Uh, and uh, then uh, after each uh, epoch, we will uh, uh, compute the uh, loss uh, using the parameters that we have so far, uh, compute the loss on the validation data set. And that would be indication of kind of early indication of our progress of how well we're doing. And the training will be performed for a number of epochs, so it's maximum 5,000 in this uh, example. Any questions so far? One, one question, Yanadi. Can you yeah. tell a little bit why the activation function on the decoder, it's a sigmoid. It seems like it makes it not symmetric, you know, the data going in. Right, right. right. Going out. Uh, so, so, okay. Uh, so why, first of all, let me explain why I take linear. That will actually will be discussed later because the, the idea is that this model with linear activation is equivalent to the principal component analysis. I'm going a little bit uh, uh, ahead of, of, of things. I will mention that later. 
That's why I wanted to compare nonlinear model with linear principal component analysis and show the advantage of the uh, nonlinear model compared to a linear active uh, uh, dimensionality reduction technique. And second, why do we have different activations? First, tangent for the for the deep model, uh, the tangent hyperbolic tangent just uh, one. First, uh, I choose tangent hyperbolic because it works well uh, for this particular model. I already checked that. But the last one should be sigmoid uh, because our purpose actually uh, I should have. Oh, sorry, I should have more slides. The linear activation is here. Uh, the hyperbolic tangent is this is activation. Uh, it varies between minus one and plus one. Uh, uh, and uh, the sigmoid activation, it's kind of similar to hyperbolic tangent, but it varies between zero and one. And at the output of uh, the network, we should have value between zero and one by design of the model, because we want to output uh, zero, so once ideally, but actually the model will output uh, something between zero and one, closer to zero, closer to one. And that's why the last of the layers should have sigmoid activation because we have want to have a particular uh, size of output. Does that address your question? Yes, thank you. So there is no problem with the lack of symmetry then in these models. Yeah, no, 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 no. It doesn't have to be symmetric actually. It just happened uh, in our uh, uh, example that it is more or less symmetric, but it doesn't have to be symmetric in general. Thank you. I didn't mention that it should be symmetric. I just said uh, I specified the basic requirement for autoencoder, but it does in general it's not supposed to be symmetric. Thank you. Okay. Next slide, if no more questions. And this slide shows the results computed from the two models, the shallow model. And the deep model, and you see that the shallow model, it we report here at validation loss. It's kind of early evaluation of the accuracy of our result. And the loss ideally should be should go to zero as, as we train uh, the model better and better, it should uh, should reduce. But for the shallow model, we see that uh, um, it uh, it actually does reduce for a while in the first several epochs. But then it stabilizes at a certain pretty high level. It does not uh, decrease anymore. However, for deep model, we see it constantly, continuously keeps decreasing. And that's what we would expect. And the reason for that is uh, that we actually have nonlinearity in our data. The third uh, expression level of the third gene is a product, which is kind of simplest kind of nonlinearity of two first expression levels. And that kind of nonlinearity, nonlinear data, is not handled well by the shallow model, which actually mimics the principal component analysis, which is a linear dimensionality reduction technique. So it cannot decouple the third variable and uh, to, uh, um, to um, squeeze the this data through the uh, two-dimensional, uh, the, the latent uh, code of the uh, dimension two. Um, and uh, the deep model performs very well. And so the deep model with nonlinear activations obviously supersedes the shallow model. And therefore, it can be regarded as a nonlinear extension of the principal component analysis. Any questions? No. So let's proceed now to the next slide. Uh, we will discuss example which is very similar to the previous one, but now instead of two uh, uh, independently expressed genes, we have three independently expressed genes, X, Z, Y, and Z. And we also have three corresponding uh, dependent genes, X, Y, X, Z, and Y, Z. And they are designed the same way as the previous data. But this simple increase of just one dimension in the data, one independent dimension, 
actually uh, results in significant consequences for the type of uh, uh, model that will be used for this uh, example. First of all, you can think of, first of all, what kind of model should we use? We will no longer discuss shallow model, but the simplest deep model you can think of is this one shown here. It's similar, very similar to the model of the deep model of the previous example, except that now the input tensor has dimension six because we have six genes in total. And the code tensor has dimension three because we have only three independent genes in this example. And it turns out that this model no longer works. Basically, you can check it yourself because you have uh, 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 simple examples here will be available. It is implemented. But the basic idea is that when you run uh, this model on this data, it will behave pretty much the same way as a shallow model of the previous example. In other words, the uh, validation loss will decrease for a while, for a few number, for a few epochs, and then will stabilize at a certain pretty high level and will not decrease anymore. So at this point, we need to revise our model. We need to actually to do hyperparameter tuning, hyperparameter optimization. And we already discussed a number of parameters, hyperparameters of this model. And uh, for this example, I will tune two hyperparameters. The first hyperparameter is depth. So far, we had depth. It's a number of green tensors. So far, we had depth one for both encoder and decoder. Now we allow depth to be a free parameter. It will take a number of values from a certain range that we will specify. And the second tunable hyperparameter will be the size of the green tensor, the number of, uh, uh, of elements in the tensor. In the previous example, that size supposed, was supposed to be the same as input and output. Now we allow the size to be free, and it can be even bigger than the size of input and output. Uh, it can vary, and we'll try to find what is the best size. And shown here is our, uh, it's a part of the code for this model. The first two steps of processing, the header and getting data. So the header is similar uh, at the, to the previous example. It's still uh, a set of Python import statements. The, at the step of getting data, it's also similar, but now we have kind of more general code this code for generation of data matrix is applicable to the actually to the data, not only with three independent genes, but with any number of independent genes. We just replace number of genes three by four, say for example, and it will work for four independent genes. In this case, we will have instead of three dependent, we will have ten dependent for for the three and in, uh, four independent will have ten dependent genes and so on. Any number of genes will be handled by this code. Uh, I didn't ask if you have questions about previous slide. Any questions about this slide? No. So I'll proceed to the next uh, two steps of the code, the defining the model and running the model. And here so it's very important slide, uh, which introduces a number of uh, important terms uh, relevant to hyperparameter optimization. So please uh, listen carefully and ask questions if you have any. So there are two fundamental differences of this code with hyperparameter optimization from the regular training code that we discussed in the previous example. The first fundamental difference is that instead of regular model, we now have a hypermodel. And what is hypermodel? It's basically the, the same as a regular model. We define the build uh, combined model. Uh, it's just a regular model, uh, similar to our regular model, slightly modified. But with tunable hyperparameters, depth and hidden dimension, and as well as for their ranges of, uh, um, and uh, the tunable hyperparameters, as well as their ranges of variation, 
uh, to be defined as the fields in a special kind of object. The object is HP. It is an object of class hyperparameters. And say what we do here is we take HP and define the field, one of the data members of that object. We specify that the data members will be integer because the depth is integer uh, hyperparameter. We specify the minimum value of the depth will be zero. Say uh, uh, the maximum will be six and the step will be one. That will be, that means we will actually uh, consider the range from one, two, three, four, five, six. The minimum value, uh, minimum value actually not included somehow the, the way uh, Keras Tuna works. Uh, so we have five possible values for depth and we will choose the best one. And for hidden dimension, we do a similar, similar way, but defined, I just wanted to illustrate another, uh, another way of defining the hyperparameter. We now have choice function uh, method. And we specify instead of the minimum value, maximum value and the step, we just specify a list of allowed values for the hidden dimension. We consider six, nine, 12 and 16. And now we take those uh, hyperparameters and substitute them into regular uh, model. Uh, in the previous example, those uh, values were just constant, some values constant. Now they're not constant, they are uh, functions, the fields in the uh, um, HP object. And that's the first fundamental difference of the hyperparameter optimization tool. The second important difference is that we define another object called Tuna, which in our case, in this particular case, would be an object of class random search. And that class will def define, determine the algorithm, the hyperparameter optimization algorithm that will be used uh, by the code. Uh, that um, uh, object, uh, uh, by defining the tuner as object, we actually, this is actually constructor of that object. And the constructor takes a number, a number of arguments. The first argument is hypermodel, which we just defined the hypermodel. Uh, then uh, there would be objective. Objective is, in our case, validation was objective is the uh, criterion that we will be using for hyperparameter optimization. So the best set of hyperparameters would be the one that minimizes that objective. Next uh, important uh, argument is maximum number of trials. The trial, what is trial? Basically it's uh, we try to evaluate uh, different, oh, in, in this model we have actually, uh, 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 26 by four, uh, 24 possible configurations of uh, hyperparameters. So six would be six possible values of depth and four possible values of hidden dimension. So the uh, total number would be 24 possible uh, configurations where configuration is basically a, a vector with depth and uh, hidden dimension. It's a, a part, uh, uh, this vector would be represent one point in the configuration space. And uh, maximum number of trials means how many possible uh, total configurations we are gonna to evaluate during the search. We will not try to evaluate all of the possible configurations, but select randomly because it's random search. Select randomly, sample randomly a subset uh, of configurations. And that would be the size of that subset. In this particular case, we specify the, the, full, uh, the same as the total number of uh, configurations. The next one is seed, it's just uh, some um, uh, initialization for randomness. There, there would be some random number generator. So we use seed some value. Um, uh, executions per trial. So every time that we evaluate a particular configuration, because it involves some randomness, we will do not just one evaluation, but we perform, uh, say, for example, three uh, evaluations, uh, three attempts to evaluate the objective. And those attempts are termed executions per trial. 
And then we will find the final, compute the final objective as a mean of those executions that run. Then uh, uh, we have project name. Uh, that will be the name of the folder. In this case, I choose a e uh, Katuner, the folder where we will store uh, the results of hyperparameter optimization. And uh, all right, it's true. I will skip that for now. It's not very important. And now, instead of uh, um, uh, the running the method fit that we normally do in training the model, we run the method search of the tuner. And that search method will actually perform the search of optimal hyperparameter configuration uh, corresponding to different, uh, um, um, to a particular, uh, uh, to, to the minimum value of objective. But uh, all other configurations will also be evaluated and will be stored in the folder that we specified as project name. Um, so in this slide, I introduced a number of new terms. Let me go through them once again, because they are important for understanding of the rest of uh, the, uh, this class. First, we introduce the hypermodel. The hypermodel is the same basically as a regular network model, but with tunable hyperparameters and their ranges of variation defined as, uh, a field, as fields in uh, a certain object, object of class hyperparameters. The tuner, tuner is object of uh, this particular class of class random search, but later on, we will discuss other possible options for types of class for tuner object. And that uh, object defines the type, the algorithm of uh, hyperparameter optimization. In this particular case, we have random search algorithm. Uh, search, search is a uh, method of the tuner object that actually performs the search for optimal configuration. Uh, hyperparameter configuration is just a, a vector of uh, com with components being uh, hyperparameters of different types. In our case, would be depth and hidden dimension. Uh, objective, I already discussed. Objective is, in our case, is validation loss. It's a criterion that will be used to find the best hyperparameter configuration. Project name, the name of the folder that where we will store all the results of hyperparameter optimization. Maximum number of trials is total number, maximum number of uh, configurations that will be evaluated. And uh, executions per trial is number of attempts that will be uh, uh, performed to evaluate the objective of each configuration. Any questions about this slide? Gennady, uh, there are two questions in the chat. Uh, one of the questions is from Chen, who is asking if the model only tunes one hidden layer. Uh, about the previous one, uh, about the, the previous slide? The current slide, I assume, uh, is as, uh, they're asking, does the model only tune one hidden layer? Oh, no, uh, uh, okay. I, once again, hidden layer is the layer that, uh, because lay transformation between data tensors, right? It takes as input one tensor and outputs another tensor. So uh, the hidden layer is, uh, by in our definition, is the layer or transformation that produces intermediate or hidden data representation uh, of data. Like uh, number of hidden layers here will basically be equal to the number of green tensors, to the number of green tensors, yes. So there will be a number of hidden layers in this model. Okay, uh, thank you, Gennady. There was another question also on the chat from Ravi who was asking, uh, he's saying you mentioned five depth values, is that correct? Uh, yes, yes. One, two, three, four, five. Mean value is not included. That's the way uh, Keras Tuna works. I'm, I, would, I would think it would be reasonable to include mean value as well in the list of, of allowed values. But it turns out that we start always uh, from mean value plus step and then further. And the last value will be max value. So total will be one, uh, two, three. Oh, I'm sorry, I said no five, six total. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
And I said, that's total number of configurations. Okay, meanwhile, it's time for a break. Let's finish this slide and uh, question, address the questions and we'll start the break, five minutes break. Okay, what was, uh, did, did I answer the question? Yes. Uh, Ravi says yes, that, that was Ravi's question. And I saw Mike uh, had a question, although I don't see yeah, um, answer that anymore. How Go much, ahead, Mike. How many, hi, this is Mike. Um, I was curious how many of these classes, I didn't see the imports, like the random search class and the hypermodel, are those custom classes or are they in Keras? No, no they're, they're part of Keras. They're a standard oh. part. I will return, uh, we will discuss, when we discuss biological example, I'll mention more tuners, tuner classes. Uh, more okay. Random search is one of them, but I'll mention others also. And give you a little bit more details about how every algorithm works. For now, it's just introductory part. Thanks. Okay, let's stop now for five minutes uh, for a break. And exactly at five minutes, in five minutes, uh, we will continue from this same point. Okay. Okay, it's time for to continue. Uh, so uh, 
unless there are more questions about this slide, I'll proceed to the next one. No questions, I don't hear any questions. So I'll go to next slide. Um, I will show you the result for the model that I showed, the hyperparameter optimization code that I showed in the previous slide. That will be shown later. But now let me uh, discuss one more uh, uh, hyperparameter optimization problem, also relevant to the same code. Uh, but now we, uh, instead of optimizing the depth and optimizing the sizes of these green tensors, the hidden data representations, we will optimize the latent dimension. Of course, we know the latent dimension for our example, it should be three example. That uh, should be three because we have only three independently expressed genes. But let's pretend now that we don't know that dimension because in general, we don't know. And uh, let's see how we could try to find the, the best value of the latent dimension from the uh, hyperparameter optimization. That kind of question, I did not see in the literature that anyone would discuss it because it's actually tricky. And I wanted to show how tricky it may be. That uh, maybe you would learn uh, uh, from this. It will be instructive for, for you. So uh, for now, we fix the num the depth at, at value three, which is good value, by the way. Uh, I will show you later that depth three is good one. It's a good one. One Depth one is not en enough. Uh, depth one has a problem. But depth three is good one. And also, I fix the size of the hidden dimension 12, at value 12. It's also a good, good value. Uh, so we have a pretty good uh, behavior. And now I fix those and will only vary the latent dimension. And the code is very similar to the code of the previous class. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, from the previous slide. Uh, so I will skip. Uh, the parts of the code that are very similar, so because it's the same, basically, uh, I do multi dots instead of that. But uh, now, when I define uh, the uh, the design of the matrix, will be the same. Uh, uh, defining hypermodel also similar, but instead of depth and uh, uh, hidden dimension, I define a latent dimension as a field in the object of uh, HP object of class hyperparameters. And that latent dimension, I choose the uh, range from mean value two, actually, because uh, I, as I mentioned, mean value itself uh, 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 is, not, is not included in the range. So the minimum value would be two, maximum value would be six. And we will try to find uh, the best one among this uh, 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 five values. And uh, the uh, uh, running the model would be also very similar, except that uh, I define project name now, uh, uh, Ketunar Latin Dim, just uh, another name of the folder where I will output results. Um, otherwise, it's very, very similar to the previous code. And uh, um, uh, here are the results that I computed. The validation loss that I computed uh, for this model, they were stored, the results were stored in the folder AE Ktuna Latin Dim. And uh, it shows me how the score that we computed for different uh, values of Latin dimension varies with the Latin dimension. So the first observation, very important, is then when Two, when we go from value two, which is wrong, obviously wrong, uh, we go to the right value three, then we see that the score drops dramatically, several orders of magnitude. And that's, that's clear. That's pretty obvious that it should be the way it should be. What may not be obvious wh why that happened is that uh, if we have further increase the latent dimension, uh, the uh, 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 score, the, the score would be the mean of the three attempts to compute the validation loss. So uh, it's a mean of the executions per trial. And uh, the score will keep decreasing. And for example, at six, it's considerably less uh, uh, than for latent dimension three. And why that happened? 
because actually uh, when we try to train this uh, model on the data, we uh, try to iteratively construct the mapping, the mapping of the original uh, variables, six variables into the say three variables, if, if latent dimension is three. And that mapping, it will be a nonlinear combination of original uh, variables. That mapping is not precise. It's only approximate. So there would be some residual in the mapping. And that residual affects the uh, uh, value of the score. So the validation loss will not be as small as it could be. But uh, with improving, increasing the number of iterations, I expect that the uh, score will be less and less because the uh, and the mapping, nonlinear mapping from the high dimensional space to low dimensional space uh, will, in, will be more and more accurate. Uh, it will be iteratively improved. Uh, so, but for say uh, latent dimension six, there is no any job to do. We do not try have to construct any uh, latent variables because the size of latent dimension is the same as size of input. We just can use the input variables for that purpose. That's why uh, this value is uh, low, no residual. Uh, a little bit not uh, surprised, it's not very obvious why at five, we have even smaller value than at six. And my understanding is that this is a result of uh, uh, kind of noise because there is some randomness, some random component in uh, computation of the validation loss. The validation data itself, itself is sampled randomly from the training data set. So uh, that's basically why there is some, it's actually very minor oscillation at a low level of uh, validation loss. Uh, it may, may, may happen. In general, we see what, uh, what the picture looks like. If we would choose the uh, uh, best hyperparameter value as the one that minimizes the loss, we would actually come to the wrong number. That would be five, which is wrong number because for five, we have so far the smallest uh, score, but the right number is three. And that number, we could probably have to have some uh, uh, post-processing of the results. Basically the right number in this case would be the smallest number after the uh, huge drop in the validation loss. The huge drop occurs here, and then we take the smallest one and that would be three. I'm not sure whether it's clear enough, is my explanation is clear enough, but please ask questions if you have any. Nadia, we have a question in the chat. Ryan mm -hmm. is asking, is a depth of three good as a start general starting point, or are you just saying three in regards to the data we will be using? Uh, three, uh, we know that is actually the right answer because we use a model with three independent independently expressed genes. All other are dependent. So they should be able, we should be able to express those dependent genes, X, Y, X, Z, and Y, Z, in terms of the first three genes. So the right answer is three. Uh, but in this example, I tried to pretend, I pretend that I don't know the right answer. And I tried to attempt it to determine that answer algorithmically through hyperparameter optimization. And I wanted to show what kind of uh, obstacles we may have. It's not always that straightforward. Uh, I mean, the uh, optimal value that we may want to use, uh, uh, the optimal value of hyperparameter is not necessarily always uh, the value that corresponds to the smallest uh, value of the validation loss of the score. Is that clear? Yes, thank you. Okay. And there's another question uh, from Nina in the chat. Uh, Nina says, to summarize, were you saying the optimal parameter is the one that decreased the score the second most? That's the second what? Yes, uh, she's saying, um, were you saying the optimal parameter is the one that decreased the score the second most, the second one? Uh, uh, for this particular, yes, yeah. for this particular, for this particular example, the point, the point was that we cannot, uh, again, once again, I'm repeating a little bit, 
uh, when we do hyperparameter optimization, of course, we try to find the uh, best hyperparameters as those that minimize our score, uh, our objective. Uh, and uh, if you follow exactly this rule, then we should choose five as the best, uh, 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 the best hyperparameter value. But we know it is wrong. And that's because the point of that is that we need we don't should should not always trust the exactly the uh, result of uh, the hyperparameter optimization. We should do some post processing, look at the result, and we, we may require some post processing, like in this case. And the post processing in this case would be additional kind of algorithm instead of choosing this value, which is the smallest corresponds to the smallest uh, objective. We would choose the smallest value of latent dimension after significant drop in the uh, validation score. If we go from five to six, the drop would be uh, when we move from two to three, right? I'm sorry. If we uh, vary latent dimension from two to six, then the drop will be at three. And that would be uh, the smallest value that already has the drop in the score. That is the right value. Is that clear enough? That's great, thank you. Okay, okay, good. Uh, no Another question in the chat, sorry. Okay, okay. Another question in the chat says, how do we pick executions for trial and how is each execution different? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, well uh, how it's different. I mentioned uh, why we uh, use not just one uh, evaluation of uh, a given hyperparameter. If we, if we choose a particular configuration, we evaluated, in other words, evaluation mean computation of the validation loss. We do this evaluation not just one time, but uh, in, uh, we have in this particular case three times. Three executions per trial is three. We do that because each evaluation involves a random component. It's not a final fixed deterministic number. And the randomness of that uh, comes from the randomness of validation uh, data set. I mentioned that the score, that score is uh, not score, but the validation loss is computed by applying our model that we have so far after a given number of epochs to the validation data set. But the validation data set is randomly sampled from the training data set. So if we do three attempts uh, of uh, three executions per trial, then at every execution, we will use a different uh, validation data set. It will be sampled differently uh, in general because it's random. Uh, and so there will be some difference, there will be some deviation between the outputs from those executions. And then we compute the mean value of the three, in this particular case, three executions. And that mean value will be the score that I reported here. Is that clear? Yes, thank you. Okay. No, no. Finally, Gennady, there's One a more? final question. Is that okay? Uh, from Joe, who's asking, uh, since the ideal value of latent dimensions is three, as you show in your uh, results table, wouldn't more iterations lower the score so that the simulation should be rerun to double check this? more iterations will lower the score. Uh -huh. uh, well, uh, I did not do that, but I can easily, I think I can easily predict to you what will happen. Uh, of course, with more iterations, uh, the most likely we will still have, of course, no doubt, we will still have significant drop in the uh, score when we go from latent dimension two to latent dimension three. There will be significant drop here. However, with increasing the number of epochs, I expect this value will keep decreasing. We just had limited number, but uh, uh, the accuracy of our nonlinear mapping from the high dimensional space to low dimensional space, the accuracy of that mapping will increase because it's approximate mapping and they, it will be less and less approximate. And so this value should basically 
uh, uh, be closer and closer to value five at, at, the, at the latent dimension five or latent dimension six. As for this five and six, they probably will be the same because they are already very low and there is some noise, but it's not relevant to our computation. Is that clear? Is that the answer? Does it John answer your yes. question? Yeah. It does. John says yes, that it does answer okay. your question. If you have more questions, please feel free to ask later, maybe after next slide. So I'll be happy to, if you miss some of the questions, uh, I, you can ask them later. No question, no problem. Or after, after the uh, presentation when we have discussion. Now I proceed to the next slide. This slide basically, uh, how do we uh, normally run the uh, simple models on BioWool? There will be a number of simple models. Uh, first, it's AE basic. That's the first model that we discussed. Then I have uh, uh, AE K tuner. I uh, specified, uh, uh, discussed the random search tuner, and that would be this code, but is this executable? But I uh, implemented also a couple other executables that implement other algorithms for hyperparameter optimization. And you can run all of them easily by just typing the name of the executable. And uh, what exactly, how exactly those algorithms uh, work, we will discuss in the, as a part of the biological example. And the one thing that I wanted to mention uh, is the results that we get for the random search uh, of the optimal hyperparameter optimization. If we, uh, I, I mentioned that we output the results, all the results into a folder with a folder with the name. In this case, I assume the folder name is AEK tuner random. So now we have another uh, uh, the uh, executable that uh, added to the list uh, the the parse K tuner results that executable will uh, analyze the result in this folder and will output us basically the uh, essence, the only the very uh, minimum information about the best hyperparameters. And if you look at those hyperparameters, the scores uh, that uh, were uh, computed for different values of hyperparameters are shown here. They are, uh, um, uh, order it with respect, uh, reverse order it uh, uh, with respect to score. So if we see here, uh, uh, this at this value, we have a sharp drop actually in decrease because it's reverse order uh, in reverse order. Uh, we start from smallest one and then keep going increasing and increasing. And after this point, we have several orders of magnitude bigger score, which means that basically all of these values before this line are, they still have some variation of the score, but pretty much all of these hyperparameters are good. And all of those below this line are, are really bad. In particular, the, uh, uh, the value with depth one, if you remember, depth one was our original model. I mentioned that it doesn't work well. With for depth one, and here dimension six is still listed here. Uh, uh, the score is very high, pretty high. But uh, all those, even though they still have some variation in the score, they're all pretty good because they still uh, of the same order of co comparable order uh, of magnitude in the score. That's basically similar to what we have seen for latent optimization of latent dimension. So. At some value of parameters, so in this particular, some for some configurations, uh, we have a significant jump in uh, in the value of the objective. And uh, in this particular case, uh, the, before the jump, we have good. All, all of those hyperparameters are relatively good, and after that, are not so good. And uh, similarly, you can run uh, Ktuner random with latent dimension, you can, that's basically the code that I discussed uh, in one of the previous slides. And then with Bayesian algorithm and the hyperband algorithm. Any questions about this slide?
No, it's, so I assume and that's clear what I wanted. The main point is basically this one. Uh, uh, that's what we normally output, uh, the kind of output that we normally have after hyperparameter optimization. And we do not necessarily have to choose uh, like this one. We can choose this one, it's a good one, but all others are not terribly different uh, in terms of the score. So we could choose any of this configuration, they will be good enough. If there is no question, then I will, uh, we are done with introductory part of this lecture. And we proceed to the first, bio, to the third biological example of this course, uh, which is application called Tibalt. Uh, the code for this application uh, that uh, is implemented in BioWolf is kind of reworked, uh, adapted version of the code uh, of the original code that was available in the GitHub here, original code. And this is a link to our code, uh, and the, basically to, not to the code, but to the uh, uh, user uh, manual page. So you will see how to run Tibalt application on Bible. And what this application is doing, it extracts biologically relevant Latin space from cancer transcriptome. The data for this project uh, came from the Cancer Genome Atlas. This uh, NIH program led by NCI and NHGRI aimed uh, to identify a complete set of uh, uh, DNA changes corresponding to different types of cancer. And the TCGA for each type of cancer, for each sample stores a number of genomic measurements uh, a set of genomic measurements, but only one of this measurement uh, is actually used by Tibo. That one measurement is just expression level of, uh, of genes uh, with sample. So each sample initially, when it is downloaded from Tibo, has uh, 20,530 genes. And accordingly, uh, there are total 10,000 and a half approximately samples. Out of those 9,700 9, something tumor samples and 727 normal samples. So total is 10,000 and a half. And they represent 33 types of cancer. Each sample is a vector, I may say vector of uh, 20,000 something expression levels of gene expression levels. And the task is to extract from this huge amount of data a meaningful biologically relevant Latin space, which will have a small number of variables, but those variables will be biologically meaningful. And we will see some benefit from using small number of variables instead of the original huge number of variables. And this task will be performed in three steps. The first step is pre-processing step. Uh, we will take uh, it, uh, Tibalt uh, takes the original samples with 20,000 of genes and extracts a subset of genes, uh, 5,000 only. Those are the genes with highest variability of expression across all samples. So uh, only 5,000 genes uh, or gene expression levels uh, will be used subsequently for each sample. The second step is actually production step, which is performed using deep learning. At this step, we will further reduce dimensionality of the data. From 5,000 genes, that's a vector of genes, we will extract only 100 uh, of essential latent variables. And that will be performed using two types of autoencoders. But the main focus is variational autoencoder. But for comparison, just for comparison purposes, they, we will also discuss denoising autoencoder. Those two models would be parts of Tibalt, uh, with current implementation of Tibalt, that can be optionally used. Either one can be used optionally. So we reduce dramatically by more than 50 fold the dimensionality of the uh, feature space. And each of those 100 Latin variables would be a linear, non-linear combination of, on average, 
of 50 different original features. And finally, post-processing step, we will verify that the samples encoded by autoencoder, the samples in those encodings, 100, each of these 100 encodings, retain biological signals. So we will see what benefit we may have from this kind of dimensionality reduction. Any questions about this slide? No. Uh, I see a question from Joe on the chat. Uh, Joe says, is an example of production identifying two or more genes with very similar expression profiles? Uh, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, yes, uh, we will see uh, on the chart that some of the uh, some of the tumors have very similar expression profiles, and we will see that example, some visualization of that, and uh, that's because actually I mentioned uh, that um, uh, Tbot is using only one measurement out of the old measurements stored in the cancer genome atlas. If we use additional measurements that would allow us to discriminate those tumors as well. But based on gene expression levels only, uh, we may not always uh, discriminate different type of tumors. Some of tumors look very similar. Uh, one question, Yanadi. So it looks like the preprocessing, the step you call preprocessing, allows you to bring the data to a number of dimensions that is smaller than the number of samples. Is that a must or models like this could initially take data that had more dimensions than samples? Uh, the number of samples is the same. It does not change the number. You, you, I think you're right. It's missing. You, you said that. Uh, number yes, of samples yes. will not change, but just each sample originally in the raw data, each sample was a vector of 20,530 uh, gene expression levels. Now we extract of those only good, only good genes, only good genes. And the good genes are those that have a lot of most variability across different samples. So basically we exclude the genes that do not vary much across different samples because those genes actually do not make much difference. Oh, I, I understand. What I'm asking is, is it mandatory that you always have less features that samples for these models, or they could take data where the number of features exceeds the number of samples? No, actually, it doesn't matter whether the number of features may be any. Uh, the authors choose 5,000, but actually it's not, this 5,000 number is not relevant to this number of samples. It's just, uh, it's two different, very two different quantities. It could be either, is a bigger, is a smaller, and then the number of samples, uh, just every sample is characterized by this 5,000 number, 5,000 features. That's the point. Thank you. Okay. No more questions. Then I proceed to the next slide, which will show us the, basically some overview of the Tbalt training code. And uh, shown here is the main function. Of course, the code is much more sophisticated than the uh, code of the previous examples. Uh, it has a number of uh, um, um, import statements, which are not shown at the very top of the file, a number of function definitions, which are also not shown here. But shown here is only the main function of the training code, which actually governs execution of the entire code. And the good news is that this main function still involves the same four basic uh, processing steps that any other Keras program that we discussed previously. It would be header, getting data, defining the model and running the model. And the header in this case would be just, uh, uh, because there are import statements are somewhere at the, at the top of the file, but the header in this particular case would be represented by uh, some function that parses command line option. You have command number of command line options uh, when you run the code, and that's just extraction of the options uh, from, the, from that command line. Then getting data, just some function that uh, uh, extract uh, the data itself that will be described in more details in the next slide, but the function that reads the data from, from the input. 
Um, and then uh, uh, the data will come, by the way, in a, a text separated format. It's kind of a, a text format, text matrix. Uh, then uh, defining the model step. That uh, would be different uh, defining the, because we, in the same code, we try, uh, we will try to run this code in two different modes. The first mode is a regular non hyperparameter optimization mode, just regular training. Say we have hyperparameters at fixed values, and we just want to train the model like we do any deep learning uh, model. In this case, we uh, define a model as just a regular combined model, encoder, decoder, and just some function that determines the model. In uh, the second mode of running this code is with hyperparameter tuning. Uh, opt uh, HPO would be not, uh, will be some value. That value is allowed to be, uh, uh, will be there are three allowed values. It may be random. Uh, and that would, in this case, it would be a random search algorithm. It can be a Bayesian. In this case, uh, KTuner would be a Bayesian optimization algorithm. And the third one, hyperband. We'll discuss later each of those options. So that's a step of defining the model. Uh, when we run in the second mode, we define, instead of the model, we define tuner, uh, keras tuner. Uh, and at the step of running the model, uh, we also have, uh, will be, uh, meaning will be different depending on the mode. If we run the uh, code in non, in non uh, HPO mode, no hyperparameter optimization, then running the model will be just calling the fit function, fit method of the, on the combined model, like we did normally for any in previous classes. If we run hyperparameter optimization, then we run the method search, uh, apply to uh, the method of keras tuner, FK tuner, like we did in the simple examples uh, earlier in this class. And uh, during this, um, uh, Processing, we will discuss all of the steps. We will, uh, in particular, discuss the two uh, uh, models, uh, regular models that uh, come uh, maybe used optionally as a part of the keyboard code the variational autoencoder and the denoisian autoencoder, which is called a dagger. Then we will discuss in more details the three tuners random search, Bayesian optimization, and hyperband. Uh, we will uh, talk about the search method. Uh, what exactly it is doing for all of these uh, 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 methods. And as a bonus, we will discuss uh, TISNE, which T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, which is a technique for uh, 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 mapping of uh, visualization, actually, of the data from uh, in the high dimensional space. Uh, in order to visualize, we first map those data into two dimensional in, in a plane. And then we do visualization. The TISNE is a part of, not a part of, uh, of the training code. It's a part of prediction code, actually. It's performed by prediction code. But we will discuss that because it's important. And the, it's an important step before we visualize the results. And we will discuss visualizations as well. Any questions so far about this one? OK, I hope that's clear. Uh, so let's proceed to the discussion of the data. So the uh, uh, um, uh, Tibalt takes uh, as input a number of very different types of data, uh, the uh, gene expression data, copy number data, uh, the mutation data, and clinical data. But uh, only the RNA gene, RNA sec gene expression data are actually used by the deep learning code. So I will focus on the, on this one. Actually, I already discussed partially uh, this uh, kind of uh, procedure of reducing dimensionality of the original uh, raw data. But all other data I use for visualizations, for various kinds of check. So I will not discuss those, just mention them in the slide. But uh, the preprocessing part, as I already mentioned in the first uh, slide of the biological example, preprocessing will uh, take as input the data matrix and text matrix in TSV format uh, with number of genes or number of columns, 20,530, and number of samples or rows, 
459, and then it will produce a subset of this data with uh, uh, the same number of uh, rows, the same number of samples, but with only 5,000 columns. And those columns will correspond to genes with maximum uh, variability across different samples. That's all I wanted to say about this slide. Any questions about this one? Okay, we move uh, to the next slide. And now we uh, proceed to discussion of the uh, two models, uh, uh, the adagio model and variation autoencoder via model. Uh, they actually, the main focus of this study is on variation autoencoder, but I will present adagio model first because it's simpler and it will allow us, allow us to appreciate the difference between the two models. And you will see what significantly different makes uh, the variational autoencoder different from uh, regular denoising autoencoder. So how the adagio denoising autoencoder works. Uh, the model shown here, the data flows from the bottom up and we take as input some good data, uh, data X, the dimension of the input data is 5,000. Then uh, we, uh, at this step, we um, um, corrupt the data. We corrupt the data on purpose uh, in order to produce a corrupted data X tilde. We corrupt the data by adding random noise. Then we use original uncorrupted data as a target. And we want to output the network, the entire network, to output the, uh, the values x prime as close as possible to the, our input uncorrupted data. So we try to uh, uh, adjust the parameters of the network during training uh, in order to minimize this, um, uh, the, some measure of the difference between the original data and the output data, uh, that, that uh, value is called reconstruction loss because we reconstruct the uh, uh, original input from the latent uh, space. In this model, so uh, uh, the corruption of the data is performed by using a special kind of uh, layer called dropout. We actually discussed the dropout layer in the second class, but what this layer is doing is basically it takes at random a certain number of elements of the input tensor. Uh, the default is 10% uh, of, of elements and it sets values of those elements uh, to zeros. Every time we do iteration of the model at every epoch, every time we pass through this layer, a different fraction of, I mean, it's the same fraction, but different uh, uh, elements of input tensor will be sampled at random to, to be set to zero. So that varies and that step is therefore is stochastic. The, this, the very, very first step of encoder is stochastic. Then uh, the, the rest of the encoder will be deterministic. And from corrupted data, we deterministically generate latent vector, which will be of dimension 100. And then uh, the decoder part of the network is completely deterministic. That's basically it uh, about the, oh, one more important point is that this model uh, uh, can be used not only to, for denoising of um, uh, gene expression data, but it can also be used for reconstruction of uh, uh, um, uh, missing values. If you have at the input, you have missing values like NAs, values not available, you can set them to zeros and at the output, you still will have non-zero values. So the model will give you, you can, in this case, if you put uh, already uh, uh, corrupted data at the input, you can set the value of dropout to zero. So no corruption will be performed. That's option, optional. And in this case, you will restore the missing values at the output, you will have uh, uh, all the values uh, non-NA. Any questions? 
Okay, looks like it's clear. Uh, the uh, the uh, denoising autoencoder is clear. Now let's discuss the variational autoencoder, which is different from the denoising autoencoder, um, uh, very different. And uh, in this case, we still at the input we have um, uh, some good data x of dimension five thousand. And in order to produce a latent vector, in this case, uh, we um, first uh, uh, deterministically generate some uh, variables, uh, network generates some variables mu and sigma, that will be parameters of a certain Gaussian distribution. And uh, then we sample the vector z randomly from that Gaussian distribution. Here, the uh, input vector is uh, of dimension 5,000. The uh, z, the latent vector of dimension 100, and both mu and sigma are also each of dimension 100. So in fact, we have 100 Gaussian distributions from which we sample randomly the uh, latent vector. And the decoder is completely deterministic. So um, uh, the uh, sampling of uh, the random latent vector from this Gaussian distribution is performed using this formula, which is known as a reparameterization tree. Here, the mu and sigma are the values that I mentioned, and epsilon is a standard normal distribution uh, with zero mean and unit standard deviation. And the idea of using, uh, behind using the reparameterization tree is to make Z differentiable with respect to network parameters. So if you want to find a derivative, which we often need to do when we do uh, training of the model, uh, doing like, uh, 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 various kind of manipulations with the model with, during the training. Um, we just, if we want to find a derivative with respect to a certain uh, weight in the network, we will differentiate mu and sigma, but epsilon will stay uh, constant because it is random, it's stochastic, but it is constant, it is fixed. So this way we get a derivative of the uh, random latent vector Z. And in the model, uh, the reparameterization trick is implemented using a special kind of uh, uh, layer called lambda layer, which is different from normal layers we uh, discussed so far. Uh, usually, every layer in a uh, network has a certain predefined function. For example, convolutional layer performs convolutional transformation. The recurrent layer performs recurrent transformation. For lambda layer, there is no predefined type of operation. So any arbitrary mathematical expression can be wrapped uh, to, be, to become a, a layer object using the lambda layer. And uh, yet another uh, in, uh, important feature of the um, variational encoder is that it uses not a single uh, loss, the reconstruction loss that we discussed for denoising autoencoder, but it uses two losses, two losses function. The second loss is regularization, called regularization loss, and the total loss would be a weighted sum of the two losses, the reconstruction loss plus with certain uh, hyperparameter kappa times regularization loss. And uh, the, at intuitive level, the reason why we have the additional loss, re regularization loss, is that we actually try to uh, force the data in the latent space, uh, in the latent space, to follow a certain Gaussian distribution. Uh, and uh, that distribution is not necessarily the same as the true distribution of the data in the latent space. So the residual between the two distributions will eventually result in the some kind of mismatch and the regularization loss. That's how we get the total loss of the, uh, uh, of the variational autoencoder. In summary, 
the uh, okay well it's time to make a break i'll finish the slide and we will do a break second break uh, so in summary the encoder of the variational to encoder uh, kind of the deterministic and stochastic uh, parts are swap uh, in the uh, denoising not encoder the stochastic was first step and the deterministic was next one but here it's otherwise any questions about variational encoder? I have one question um, regarding when you sample the latent space. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you expect the reconstructed X bar to be similar to X if you just sample the latent space? Because you are here X got into like you and Sigma on this hundred dimension vector, right? And then you sample it. So sampling randomly, it might just, you can sample something that's very different from X. Right, so you're right, how, you're right. You're how right. behind the scene that works. Right, we, we do not expect it to be the same exactly. We do not expect X and X prime to be exactly the same, but we try to minimize the difference. We adjust, we do whatever we can do, the, the maximum we can do. So we try to tune the parameters of the network. And actually we do not minimize only the difference between X and X prime. But we try to minimize this entire loss, the reconstruction loss plus uh, K times regularization loss. And that's the uh, loss function used by variational encoder. But it's not gonna be zero, never. It will, we can just uh, reduce it to some extent, but it's not gonna to become uh, as close to zero as we have seen for simple models in the, in the introductory part. Thank you. Okay, let's stop at this point uh, for a five minutes break and then we continue, can continue. If you still have question, ask them after the break. And we will start from this same point, okay?
Okay, the time for uh, to continue. Are there any questions about this slide? No. Then I proceed to the next one. If you have a question about this one, you can ask uh, later. Now uh, let's talk about the hyperparameter optimization for T-belt crew. First of all, why do we do it? Uh, why the authors actually that uh, hyperparameter tuning was performed by the authors of the original crew, and why to do it at all? Well, actually, by uh, tuning hyperparameters is the only way for us to improve the in desirable way, the properties of the mapping of high, uh, from the high dimensional uh, space to the low dimensional, to the small, to the from 5,000 features to the 100 features. We can improve the properties of this mapping by tuning hyperparameters. And the authors uh, of the original code uh, performed tuning of six different hyperparameters shown in this slide. The first one, depth and hidden dimension, are similar to what I already discussed for the simple model. They are slightly differently defined, but uh, basically it's pretty much the same idea. And uh, I'll only, uh, uh, the K parameter is uh, actually uh, that we mentioned, that's the weight of the uh, regularization loss from the previous slide uh, when we compute the total loss of the variational autoencoder. Uh, the base and the other three parameters are standard uh, 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 hyperparameters used by any deep learning uh, models. The batch size, the number of epochs, and the learning rate. And the ranges of those, uh, uh, ranges of variation of those hyperparameters are shown. Those are ranges used by the original Tibalt code. The green, in green font, I showed the optimal values that the authors found for this values and total number of this um, kind of uh, configurations would be 1280 possible configurations. So here configuration will be a vector of six different types of uh, six uh, hyperparameters. Uh, the method, of course, that's a lot, 1280, that's a lot. And uh, the authors uh, performed, they did not use Keras tuner for that purpose, by the way. They just did uh, some script uh, looping through all possible values. In uh, modern terminology, in the terminology of hyperparameter optimization, the method that they used is called a grid search. So basically, they have a grid of possible values. Each configuration show, shown here uh, as a red a dot. Uh, I showed here two, only two hyperparameters, one and two. In reality, they use six, as I mentioned. And they just, uh, grid search is just a systematic enumeration of all possible configurations and evaluation of each configuration, evaluation of the loss of the uh, validation loss for each of the configuration. That uh, <clears throat> is pretty exp expensive, computationally expensive procedure because a lot of uh, configurations. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Keras tuner does not support that one. It's too expensive because Keras tuner at least at the moment, is not parallelized. It uh, performs sequential search of uh, each uh, evaluation of each configuration. Uh, but uh, grid search is performed by another important application that is installed on BioWolf and is available. So you can optionally use this one. It's called Candle. The uh, link to the Candle uh, read uh, manual pages, uh, user manual pages here. Candle performs the grid search in parallel by simultaneously evaluating uh, the configurations on multiple CPUs and then summarizing the results. So it's very effect efficient. Uh, in addition to the grid search, uh, Candle also performs another, uses another algorithm, Bayesian search, which I will mention. It was also used by Keras Tuna, so I will discuss it in a short while. So Keras is pretty good uh, choice for, especially for BioWolf users. Uh, and uh, there is uh, actually, uh, uh, it can be run also included in the Keras Tuna, the author of the person who manages Kendall uh, reported, we had some communication. It turns out it can be also included in the Keras Tuna as an option, as an additional option. Um, anyway, uh, 
Uh, Keras tuner, uh, as I mentioned, does not perform parallel uh, process and uh, parallel evaluation of configurations. So it uses uh, other algorithms that uh, kind of uh, allow uh, kind of uh, uh, faster than the grid search. Not so many configurations uh, are evaluated. And those are random search, Bayesian optimization, hyperband. And there's one more tuner called scikit-learn, STA-learn. Uh, but this one is still in the process of, uh, of uh, 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 improve modification. So actually, I will discuss on the, the first three. Uh, random search. The random search algorithm is, in a way, similar to the grid search. But instead of um, exhaustive enumeration of all possible configurations, random search samples randomly a subset of the configurations and evaluates only the values of those uh, configurations. So because it's only subset, we expect that the number of configurations will be smaller than for, uh, for the grid search. And it will be affordable for the Keras tuner. On the other hand, those, that number of configurations should be not so small. It should be representative enough. Hopefully, the data points uh, from these configurations will come from different areas of the regions of the configuration space. So we will not miss important, hopefully, will not miss an important configuration that provides a minimum to the search. Uh, that's random search. Uh, but uh, at random search, we completely randomly select the next configuration uh, for evaluation. The next algorithm is Bayesian optimization. Uh, as opposed to random search, in the Bayesian optimization, we attempt to kind of uh, optimize selection of the next configuration. So if we have already several configurations evaluated, then Bayesian optimization algorithm attempts to use a certain probabilistic model under the hood to uh, infer, to make a guess about the next uh, configuration, which should be good, is expected to be good based on the model and based on already existing uh, evaluations of the previous configurations. So in this chart, uh, the x-axis represent the hyperparameter space, which is shown as one-dimensional. But in reality, of course, it is multidimensional. And the y-axis represents basically our uh, expected value of uh, the objective according to our probabilistic model, the internal probabilistic model of the algorithm. So uh, basically, we want to find um, uh, as a next choose the next configuration to be the point where the uh, objective, the expected, expected value objective has a minimum or maximum. Well, in our case, it's minimum. But in general, it could be either maximized or minimized, uh, depending on the application. And uh, of course, after each uh, next evaluation of a new configuration, the uh, function, our model, will be revised. And new predictions will be produced because we have more input data. And uh, this way, we will kind of optimize the selection of next configuration. Uh, existing empirical evidence suggests that, in general, Bayesian optimization overperforms the random search because we have kind of more directed search of new configuration instead of just completely random. But uh, it doesn't mean that Bayesian optimization is always better because in, implicitly the Bayesian uh, optimization assumes some kind of smoothness of the function that we are trying to uh, minimize. Uh, in reality, the smoothness is under question. Uh, the evaluations, each of those evaluations that we already performed is noisy. That may kind of complicate the task. And the function that we are trying to uh, minimize is not generally convex. In other words, it does not have a single global minimum. It's maybe a function with multiple minima. So it's not always, uh, and, and it doesn't mean that I would always recommend Bayesian optimization instead of random search. 
The next one that we discuss is uh, hyperband. The hyperband is yet another way to uh, uh, facilitate uh, the, find, uh, the search for the best uh, configuration uh, and find the best, the winner, the winner configuration. That, uh, uh, as opposed to the previous two algorithms we discussed, it performs not evaluation of one configuration at a time, but it picks the whole bunch of configurations at the same time and evaluates all of them together simultaneously. And the main idea of hyperband is uh, so-called early stopping. Early stopping means that when we want to find the winner, uh, we want to find uh, the winner uh, of the uh, uh, hyperparameter configuration that will be the winner, that will uh, result in the smallest uh, uh, validation loss. However, to find the winner, we often do not need to run the training procedure over the entire number of epochs, say total maybe 2,000, 5,000. We actually can identify a winner much earlier after say, for example, running 100 epochs. It already will be clear who, who is winning, who is losing. And that's example, uh, kind of for example, how a typical hyperband algorithm could work. We take uh, a bunch of data points, for example, 64, say, for example, or any other power of two. Uh, we uh, uh, run all of those uh, configurations, but not on 2,000 epochs, but only 100 e epochs, for example. Then after 100 epochs, we see who is the winner. And we discard the worst performance, one half of worst performers. We keep only one half of the best performers. Then we do a run for the remaining data. We run it for another 100 epochs. And again, do the same, uh, discard half of low, lost, lower performers and keep only the best ones. And do that, continue uh, this way until we get only one uh, configuration left. And that would be the winner. Um, uh, of course, I mentioned 100 epoch as, a, as a, a number of epochs after which we stop perform stopping, but it's not fixed number. The number of epochs for, uh, uh, for doing early stopping is determined by hyperband algorithm itself. It's all, all built in. And uh, the main idea is this early stopping. Um, the hyperband algorithm on simple examples that we discussed in the first class, half of the lecture, uh, actually performs much better, much faster than random search and Bayesian optimization. Uh, and uh, on the simple models, I found that all the three, all the, all the three algorithms uh, predict the same winner. The winner meaning the uh, configuration with the lowest value of uh, validation loss. The answer is the same for the three on simple model. Uh, but in general, again, Hyperband has still its limitation. Basically, if uh, the certain configuration wins uh, during the first 100 epoch uh, or loses during 100 epochs, it doesn't mean it will can keep losing on, at the remaining. We already thrown it away, but it can uh, actually perform better at later time, at later uh, number of epochs. So it's kind of limitation of hyperband. Um, and the last one, it's still, I mentioned, it's still under construction, so I will not discuss on this one, but the idea is to use uh, uh, hyperparameter tuning uh, algorithms from the scikit-learn uh, package, that's the basic idea. Right now, it does not produce anything new beyond these three algorithms. Any questions about this slide? So, um, so given so um, these different Keras tuners, um, under what circumstances would each would each Keras tuner be advantageous? Because uh, I'm thinking that yes, there's random search, there's Bayesian, there's oh oh sorry. Um, so basically, uh, the um, so what, when I'm seeing these uh, four different these five different um, algorithms, uh, I'm thinking that, well, maybe there are different um, sets for which they're advantageous. Uh, which one would you say is the most versatile? 
Um, it's hard to say because we, it, it, I, it, the answer, I would, I would try to give the answer if I know more about the problem. The first oh, so thing, actually hard to say, I mentioned already uh, during, for example, Bayesian optimization. It would be good if we know that the function that we try to uh, evaluate is smooth function. And ideally, if it has only one minimum or one maximum, that would be perfect. But we never know in generally, we don't know how this function looks like and how smooth it is and how noisy are our evaluations. So I cannot say for sure whether or not uh, Bayesian algorithm is the best for any arbitrary problem. It will depend on a number of conditions. So my inclination would be to try different approaches and then based on the result, choose which one the best, but not focus on one particular only. Just because right. we, don't, we don't have uh, enough information gener in general about the problem to decide which algorithm would work the best. So it really then uh, depends on the research question and uh, the kind of data that you're working with. Uh, that's right. Uh, research question actually basically is the same. Uh, they are similar, but uh, the data, yes, uh, it would depend on the data. Uh, on the model that you use, on the type of hyperparameters that you try to use. So um, I would say we should uh, try at least two different uh, algorithms and see how, how they perform, what you get uh, um, based on the post-processing uh, or, or overview of the results, you will decide which one you will uh, end up with. All right, thank you. You're welcome. And I also mentioned the grid algorithm. It's all not, not only a uh, candle uh, uh, algorithm for hyperparameter tuning. It's applicable not only to grid search, but also to Bayesian. Uh, it performs Bayesian optimization. And mm -hmm. also it's efficient, pretty efficient. So you may consider candle as another alternative to uh, for your application. OK. Any other questions? No, okay, we can, uh, if there are questions, we can uh, ask, uh, discuss them later or at the discussion part. Let me proceed to the next very, I think very important uh, question about how the, our encodings retain biological signals. So we are so far discussing about how we could uh, design, construct a map that uh, basically maps the features from the high dimensional space to very low dimensional, relatively low dimensional. But uh, once we've got those 100 encodings, how would it benefit from those encodings? What new, what, what would be the uh, benefit from that? And uh, uh, authors of the uh, uh, table provide several kind of evidences uh, that is useful. And one of them is here uh, is uh, if we take, for example, encoding just one, in, one of the 100 encoding, encoding number 82. It turns out just this encoding separates, stratifies patient sex. So here we have data points correspond to different samples, some 10,459 samples total. So this many data points we have. If we just draw this line, we see, and the samples are colored depending on the gender. So female are uh, pink and uh, the male are whatever, blue. And we see that, uh, that if we draw this line, that we then we, pre with pretty high accuracy, not 100% not of accuracy, but pretty good accuracy, we can discriminate the samples by patient sex. And just try to imagine how difficult it would be for you to draw such line or maybe surface in the original high dimensional, 5,000 dimensional space, how would you find regions corresponding to different sex? That would be extremely different, I think. But this encoding simplifies the task dramatically. The other example uh, is here. And it turns out that uh, the two, if you take two encodings, encoding number 53 and number 66, they allow to separate different types of melanoma cancer. 
And again, but the same, we have data points represent samples. Uh, those, uh, uh, the uh, violet ones and the green ones are not separated well, but at least uh, blue ones and the green ones are separated pretty well by this line. It's again, uh, with small number of uh, variables and codings, you can do some kind of uh, uh, certification, some separation. And finally, the third evidence uh, is uh, shown here. We uh, here present the results of TISNE. I will discuss TISNE, uh, T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding technique, in the next slide. But TISNE, what it is doing, it's mapping uh, the data uh, for visualization, mapping data from the very high dimensional space to just two dimensional space where the data could be visualized. And what we have here in, in the upper chart shows the samples again, each data point is a sample uh, that were mapped from encoded so, uh, from the 100 dimensional space to two dimensional space. So different clusters here correspond to different types of cancer. And the point is that the clusters are pretty well separated. So uh, using 100 features only instead of original 5,000 features, but by the way, the, the lower chart, the same kind of uh, procedure, but uh, the uh, original RNA-seq data. In other words, for the lower chart, the, each sample was characterized by 2,000 uh, features. And uh, for upper chart, each sample was characterized by only 100 features. And nevertheless, those 100 features keep the information about, the, uh, uh, about each sample, about the type of cancer corresponding to the sample pretty well. There are some clusters that are mixed, but they are mixed both in uh, uh, um, encoded samples and in the original samples. They, uh, that's because uh, not uh, all of the types of cancer can be discriminated based on the, on the gene expression level. I mentioned that already previously, but if we would use additional measurements that are available in the cancer genome atlas, we might be able to discriminate even those types of cancer with additional information. Uh, but the relative position of the clusters uh, in this chart does not matter. Uh, it just uh, only what matters is that uh, clusters are separate, look, look like they are separate. Uh, which means the encoding of uh, variational, using variational autoencoder preserves the clusters. It does not mix the clusters in general. Any questions? Yeah, for the, for the figure on the left, how do, how do you get the uh, correspondence between the latent space and the property you're looking for? So here you're showing like, you know, 82 plus 85, right? If you have a hundred, I, I usually will try all of them and then find out the one that hits the- Actually, actually um, I'm sorry, yes. No, no, no yeah, I mean, if you, that, that was the main question. Will, will it have, you know, you, you wanna map back the latent space to some physical properties, right? And uh, you have a hundred in there um, and you have specific number of physical properties, but here you're actually taking a pair of of the uh, elements in the latent space and seeing if them if they correspond to a physical property, right? So just for the graph on the top, if I have a hundred possible latent um, features, um, I have order of, or usually of n squared possible combination that I need to track to a specific physical property, which you're showing here is gender. So to find this interesting correspondence, like a better way we can reduce the search space. No, actually, actually, if you're talking about this uh, chart, it, it looks like you're talking about this upper left chart. Actually, the 85 doesn't matter. 85 just given as one example. The, the just using encoding 82 is sufficient for, uh, for, for the purposes. If you just uh, uh, use 80, the encoding 82 and gives you the boundary, which is parallel to the second axis, right? So. Right. Uh, it, only using encoding 82 is sufficient uh, for prediction of the sample uh, of the of the sex of a sample. So then, then, okay, then the one the bottom one would be more of like you know interesting one like to talk about. 
I agree with you. The top one, 82, was sufficient, but the bottom one, you needed both of them. As, as for the second one, you could, I assume you can use any, any other encoding. Yeah, yeah, but, but for the lower picture where you used 53 and 66. Yes, for this one, yes, authors. But the point is here that uh, it, uh, those encodings do preserve biological signals. Yes, uh, in general, how we would find, I'm not sure how authors identified this particular encodings, they do not describe it in the paper. Or maybe they do, but you can read the paper. I, I missed that. I did not uh, get the point how exactly they did it. Uh, but in general, looks like, uh, at least for this particular data, once you have done uh, <clears throat> a dimensional reduction, you not you can now, you probably can find other combinations of encodings that would separate other types of cancer. And that all uh, produces some simple way of, uh, of uh, um, discriminating uh, different types of cancer it would be much simpler than uh, if you would use original multidimensional uh, feature space. Okay. And I have a follow-up question on, not a follow-up question, a, a different question for the, when you show the TSNI for the variation autoencoder. So mm -hmm. as I understand, you start with your input signal and then you, you go to the latent space, but the latent space are, are the mean and standard deviation of this uh, Gaussian distribution. So in order to generate the latent vector, do you sample these distributions as you did when, in training or what do you do to, to get the latent the vector? Yes, yes, we do exactly like we described in the, uh, in the, uh, in the slide when, when I described. Yes, we, we sample randomly. The latent vector is sampled randomly. To, and then convert it to TISNI, right? To, yes. To, to make the TISNI plot, convert yes. it to the dimension. Because the latent vector is not, it's, it's basically mu and sigma. It's not, you, you cannot use these values as is, right? You have to uh, the sample let, them. Let, latent vector would be 100 dimension. So uh, the input for TISNI in this particular case would be a matrix of uh, 100 columns. It will be 100 columns because they have 100 uh, encodings, and uh, the number of rows would be 10,459, the, the same as number of samples. And then we, uh, from those uh, uh, data, where each point, each sample is represented by a vector of 100 encodings, we will produce this picture, map those two, two dimensions. Actually, uh, the way we map it will be discussed in the next slide. Uh, a little bit uh, more details about that. But yes, uh, we use uh, basically as input, we use latent uh, variables from the latent space. Okay, sounds good. I just want to confirm because the latent space is a vector of mu and a vector of sigma, but you, right? No, so la latent space is, is Z, uh, Z. We uh, mu and sigma are kind of our intermediate results of variables, okay. which are parameters of the Gaussian distribution and uh, the final latent vector is Z, uh, that which we sampled using reparameterization trick. Sounds good. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if no questions, I will proceed to the next slide, which gives a little bit more uh, input about the TISNIA, the distributed stochastic number embedded. So our purpose is we have, uh, 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 by reducing the, uh, a number of uh, features from 5,000 to 100, we did a lot. So that's more than a uh, 50 fold reduction. But if you want to visualize this data, 100 is still too much. We need uh, to uh, plot data in two dimensions, maybe maximum three dimensions where we can do visualization. But uh, how do we do that? And uh, just uh, a, a most straightforward technique would be just take uh, the data in multidimensional space and project on one or two axes. Uh, like in this uh, simplified example, the high dimensional space is uh, represented by two dimensions. Here we have uh, clusters in high dimensional space and the low dimensional space would be one dimensional. So we try to kind of attempt to uh, plot the data by projection by projecting them on one of axis. And we see this projections mixes the cluster. That's not what we want to do. 
The same if we do a projection on y-axis, the same problem. And Kisnia would be the approach to, uh, to do this uh, visualization because Kisnia not just simply project uh, on axis, but it shifts appropriately the uh, different clusters. So the relative positions of the cluster doesn't matter, but uh, each of the clusters uh, keeps the, uh, the same neighbors. In other words, data points that were neighbors in the original high dimensional uh, space will keep uh, to be the neighbors in the low dimensional space. And the TISNIA is performed, uh, it is implemented as a function in the scikit-learn package. Uh, and that function takes a number of input arguments. And I'll discuss only three most important, most relevant to our task, uh, three uh, uh, arguments. That's perplexity, initialization, and the learning rate. Uh, the perplexity is uh, the most important uh, parameter. Uh, what is perplexity? Is basically perplexity is a number of neighbors uh, in the vicinity of a given data point. So in a Tisney algorithm, uh, the vicinity of a given data point or a given sample is defined not in terms of the geometry uh, of, say, a radius of a certain size around a given data point, it would be vicinity. No, no, nothing like that. The vicinity is defined whatever size, it, physical size it is, but the vicinity should have a given number of neighbors. And that given number, expected number of neighbors is defined by parameter perplexity. By default it's 30, but it may vary for I say from five to 50 usually, and it depends on your data. If your data are uh, um, um, kind of scare, uh, scattered data like this one, then you would uh, set the perplexity of five, small one, because if you take 50, say, for example, then you, that vicinity will include all of these data points. Obviously, you want to have low perplexity. On the other hand, if you have dense clusters in the data, then the perplexity may be higher. So that would be each cluster would include, uh, data point will include the uh, uh, neighbors from the same cluster. And uh, the Tibalt's choice, the Tibalt chose uh, um, the perplexity 20 because it was actually recommended uh, for similar type of data in this uh, uh, paper with the link provided. By the way, the first link points to the original paper, the classical paper where the Tisney algorithm was proposed. And the second uh, paper is a kind of practical paper which discusses uh, uh, the aspects of application of Tisney to single cell transcriptomics. And they can, came up, uh, uh, considered multiple uh, 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 model data sets and came up with some recommendations. So one of their recommendations is perplexity uh, for, for this kind of data. The other recommendation is about uh, initialization. When we do uh, TISNIA, we basically uh, kind of uh, run uh, uh, gradient descent, and descent algorithm, some kind of minimization algorithm. The uh, minimization will be performed by there is some loss function, uh, and uh, the minimization will be performed uh, in, um, in there is some initial distribution of uh, uh, samples in the uh, low dimensional space. And then you kind of uh, run gradient descent uh, and this uh, distribution evolves to the final distribution that we have seen in the charts. And uh, the question is, how do we choose initial distribution of data points from which we start uh, in uh, the low dimensional space? The recommendation from this authors is to use principal component analysis, uh, the uh, data, the distribution determined by PCA. What this means? Uh, it means we uh, take original high dimensional data, then perform principal component analysis on those data, uh, select two main principal components, which will correspond to two vectors. And these two main vectors will define a two dimensional uh, space in the two dimensional uh, uh, plane in the original multi dimensional space. Then we project all of the data points of the high dimensional space on this two dimensional plane 
And we use this projection as initialization in the low dimensional space. And that looks like it works better than when you choose completely random initial distribution. And the third one is a learning rate. It's a, some kind of uh, uh, procedure of how fast your uh, 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 gradient descent algorithm works, how fast your uh, uh, distribution evolves in the, in particular in the low dimensional space. And uh, the standard uh, uh, learning rate, the default is 200. By the way, uh, initialization is random, uh, is, uh, default is random, but uh, the authors recommended uh, principal component analysis, PCA initialization. And for learning rate, the default is 200, but the authors found that for data sets of large enough dimension, uh, it would make sense to use uh, learning rate as a maximum of 200 and total number of samples divided by 12, whichever is better, so whichever is higher. So this is kind of uh, a recommendation from this paper. You can read the paper for more details. Any questions about the slide? Looks like, it looks like it's clear. So let me proceed to the next one then, which actually we uh, uh, come to the, uh, the slide before the last, how you can run Tbalt on BioWolf. Uh, you basically, uh, I use, show it how you run it using uh, interactive session. You can allocate interactive session with certain, say I use GPU. Uh, then I load model Tbalt. Then uh, if you, List uh, Tbalt SARP uh, uh, environmental variable that points to the bin directory of the code. And you see a number of executables in that uh, directory. There is the executable for downloading original data, uh, for uh, pre processing data, and uh, for training, uh, for uh, uh, prediction, and for visualization. The visualization one, visualization one is R script. Then you can run the training procedure, the training executable in two different modes. You can run it just by specifying the name of the model, variational autoencoder or uh, uh, denoising autoencoder, plus additional options. And that would be just regular training procedure without hyperparameter optimization. But you can also run it in high, uh, HPO uh, uh, mode. Uh, you specify one of three available hyperparameters tuning uh, algorithms. HPO may be random, maybe Bayesian, maybe hyperband. And plus, uh, uh, if you want to use, uh, to vary hyperparameters, whatever, you, you can vary only the hyperparameters uh, that I listed in the one of the previous, only the six hyperparameters that were uh, varied by the, in the original paper. So there are six, uh, uh, the depth, the hidden dimension K, kappa, uh, batch size, number of epochs, and the learning rate. And if you want to specify the range of variation of those parameters, you just use command line option and uh, use comma separated values. For example, if we want to try depth one, two, six, uh, four, six, then we do the comma separated uh, values of depth or hidden dimension the same way. And uh, then you can do prediction. The predict algorithm basically predict uh, based on your training, uh, uh, predict what you will have in the latent space, the latent space vector, as well as predict uh, algorithm also includes the running TSNI. The TSNI algorithm is run from within the predict uh, uh, executable. And finally, uh, visualize, visualization of, uh, there are a number of things that could visualize. The charts that I showed previously uh, uh, in, when we discussed uh, uh, the low dimensional encoding, how it retains biological signals, all of those charts can be visualized with appropriate command. And you can see uh, all other visualization options in the uh, user manual page for Tbalt, which is available on uh, our web page. Any questions about this one? Okay, no question. Uh, and that last uh, slide just uh, summarizes uh, what we discussed in this uh, presentation. So we looked first at the very simple 
basic models, uh, 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 shallow and deep one, without any uh, 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 hyperparameter optimization. We, I mentioned that uh, the shallow model mimics the principal component analysis and does not handle well the data which involve non-linearities, non but the deep uh, autoencoder with nonlinear uh, activations uh, handles pretty well those data. And so it can be regarded as extension of the linear dimensionality reduction techniques such as principal component analysis. Then we discuss a number of terms uh, and we have seen simple uh, hyperparameter optimization result on simple models, which I think was pretty, uh, for me at least, was very useful uh, to understand how, what, what to expect from hyperparameter tuning. Uh, then we uh, also discussed the uh, uh, different par parameters uh, of uh, important terms uh, in, involved in hyperparameter tuning. And uh, in the biological example, we discussed the uh, variational encoder and uh, denoising autoencoder. Uh, we discussed uh, different types of tuners, uh, of search uh, of the best configuration. And we also briefly reviewed the TSNI algorithm uh, for uh, visualization of high dimensional data. Thank you. Any questions? And now we can ask more general questions and uh, discuss something. Yes, well, I had I actually had two questions that um, I was going to ask at that time, but um, at that time, at that time, the internet was a bit um, slow where I was. But the um, the first is um, I was going to ask which is more under which circumstances would adage or ve be more advantageous, but but I think. Uh, I got a clue as to that answer when I saw the the different the answer for the different Keras tuners, and I thought, okay, well, uh, maybe the by that I meant like if the research question sort of um, determines which Keras tuner to use, then I guess the same principle would apply to adage versus ve. Now, uh, which sort of um, and now here's the other the other actual question that I have for right now is for for high dimensional data. Um, if you're going to use something like Tybalt, um, could you could one also use UMAP for visualization as well? I mean, uh, theoretically, you could. If it if it could be used in TSNI, it could also be used in UMAP, right? Yes, yes. Uh, UMAP is another very good uh, dimensional reduction technique. I actually was thinking about trying to implement UMAP uh, in addition to TSNI, but it was, uh, uh, I mean, optionally. I could try to, in addition to Disney, to try UMAP. And I'm still interested, but just did not have time and enough time to add this implementation. Yes, you can use UMAP in addition to Disney. That's another very promising, uh, looks like very promising uh, dimensional reduction a technique that would allow to visualize high dimensional data. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. No more questions? Then uh, we can, uh, if no questions, we can uh, briefly, how much do we have? Uh, oh, we almost don't have time. Uh, seven minutes left till the end of the class. That was, I think, I hope that was interesting. Uh, there was many questions uh, and uh, I hope you learned something from that. But let me just point to, just in case you want to practice with the software, once again, you have this uh, uh, web page which discuss, describes how to run Tbalt. You can play with that software with this hyperparameter tuning using hyperband, Bayesian, and random. And also, you can play with uh, <clears throat> simple uh, models that we discussed previously. Um, I, I'm it's kind of not a question, but I'm just curious uh, from uh, your experience working with uh, people at uh, NIH, how they are how they are running hyperparameter tuning uh, for their problems. If they actually ah. do it, what kind of algorithms they do, what kind of compute they use, and so on. Well, I know that some people. Uh, I, I I'm not aware of anyone who uses Keras tuner, to be honest. I think a Keras tuner, I think that uh, Candle is pretty good package. I would try to use a Candle because it's very efficient. 
Uh, Keras Tuna is good, in my opinion, uh, just for learning purposes to, because it allows to run very simple examples and it allows to run examples in uh, interactive mode. Whereas Kendall, uh, as far as I know, actually I know, uh, it does not run in interactive mode. Uh, Kendall always submits the job to the cluster. So in terms of learning, I think uh, Keras Tuna has some advantage for very beginners. From If you learn from scratch, if you are not familiar with hyperparameter tuning, then playing with Keras Tuner, I think would be beneficial. But in terms of large scale uh, hyperparameter tuning, I think uh, Keras may be too slow in general, I, except that uh, if you're lucky with uh, hyperband, hyperband is pretty fast, very fast algorithm. Um, uh, another point about, uh, you asked about how people use. Actually, during my previous classes, many people asked me, how can I tune uh, uh, hyperparameter? How can I choose hyperparameters? And usually my answer was uh, just uh, look what other people used uh, in similar, uh, in similar, not exactly in the same exact model like yours, but similar model. And if they were successful, try to learn that from that experience. Now, this is the first example when I can offer some uh, algorithm uh, for tuning hyperparameters. And as far as I, so based on my experience, uh, people did not, I mean, at least the, those who took my previous classes did not use uh, the any hyperparameter optimization packages much. Uh, or maybe they were advanced enough people, they did not come to this introductory class. They already know what they're doing. And uh, I, I did not hear about any other uh, 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 packages that they used. Oh, one more package was, uh, uh, yes, uh, what it's called, whatever it's called. Uh, I can't remember now, but uh, maybe I'll, if you can send me email asking about the package, I can, I can send you the name of yet another package that could be used as an alternative. Uh, but there are many other uh, 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 hyperparameter tuning packages on the web. So the only one that I'm aware on BioWolf is Kendall. Thank you so much, Yanadi. <laughs> Uh, if there is no question, again, we can just because we have very limited uh, uh, three minutes left for the to the end of the class, so you can try uh, to use uh, to practice with these simple examples. I think that you learn something from that from running those simple examples. You can modify uh, them on your own, download them, modify as you wish, and see how that works. I learned a lot from, from this in particular, from these results. Uh, you see how uh, the, there is, basically it looks like there is not a single good, really good uh, hyperparameter configuration, but there is a, a subset of good configuration, a subset of bad configurations. That's what I learned from this example. And uh, I, that's probably a uh, more general uh, uh, situation. Uh, for a real biological example, probably we have something similar, but the authors of uh, uh, Thibault did not dig that uh, deep enough uh, into their model. Uh, so they, I'm sure there is still room for improvement uh, of uh, the biological example. Uh, thank you uh, everyone for coming. Uh, if you have questions, please feel, feel free to uh, email me uh, uh, and uh, Whenever the recording of this class is available on our website, I will send email to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank, thank you, Gennady. Thank you. All right, uh, so I, I'm 